Hi, I'm Steve Clements, and I have a couple of questions. After the release of a prominent Rwandan activist, what was the U.S. role? And what is the White House doing to bring back the dozens of other Americans still detained abroad? Let's get to the bottom line. You could almost hear a sigh of relief both in Africa and the United States when Paul Recesa-Beguina was recently released from jail by Rwanda's president, Paul Kagame. Recesa-Beguina is credited with sheltering more than a thousand ethnic Tutsis and Hutus at the hotel he managed during Rwanda's genocide almost 30 years ago, where almost a million people killed each other in less than 100 days. The Hollywood movie Hotel Rwanda from 2004 was inspired by his story. Now he'll be moving back to the U.S., where he has permanent residency, and the news of his release was welcomed by President Joe Biden. But what of the dozens of other American citizens and residents held by governments around the world? And is the rising trend of detaining American citizens and residents by governments around the world becoming a national security issue? Joining us today from the White House is Joshua Gelter, the Deputy Homeland Security Advisor at the National Security Council. Joshua, it's great to be with you. Um, let me just start with the, the big news. Paul Recesa-Beguina is soon going to be back in the United States. Um, Joe Biden's White House made this a priority. Tell us how it unfolded. Why was Paul Recesa-Beguina a high-priority item on President Biden's to-do list? Steve, thanks so much for the, the chance to, to join you for this conversation. And I think the story actually begins before President Biden's inauguration. It begins during the, the transition when Jake Sullivan, among others, the incoming national security advisor, uh, directed a number of us to hit the ground running on day one when it comes to bringing home Americans uh, held abroad. And during that transition, he asked a, a few of us who had worked on these types of issues in the past in government to make sure we were up to speed on current cases and there were cases like Paul Recessa Beguina's that began before day one, that we, in a sense, inherited as an administration. Some of that involved researching where those cases stood. Some of it involved engaging with families and with those advocating for and representing families. But it meant that when we got here to, to the White House on day one of the administration, this really could be a priority from the get-go. Now, taking the, the story a bit forward from there, as I indicated, uh, Paul's case was among those we inherited as an administration. And really from the outset, both publicly and privately, we indicated what an imperative it was to resolve this matter, to resolve it in a way that reunited Paul with his family here in the United States, and that removed what was clearly a bilateral irritant in the U.S.-Rwanda relationship. That, uh, as I indicated, took some forms that were public. It took some forms that were private. It took the form of the, the Secretary of State's visit to Kigali in August of uh, 2021, uh, in which, of course, this issue was raised. I think we really entered a, a new phase of resolving the matter when Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, started having some very constructive, very quiet conversations with key officials in the Rwandan government. And in some ways, we were able to make the pivot from simply indicating that this had to get resolved to talking through the how of it, the sequence, the steps that would be necessary to get from a situation that we all found unsustainable to the happy result today. Maybe we can talk more about that, Steve. In this particular case, this is different than Brittany Griner. This is different than Paul Whelan. This is different. And I'm interested in someone in your role, as you look at these cases, is there a template? Are there things that we're not seeing that help you um, move from one to case? Or is everyone, every one of them so extraordinarily different that, that you have to actually build a process that's unique unto that case? I think there are some principles that apply across cases, but then the recovery, the strategy, the tactics, very case specific. Let, let me tell you what I think some of those principles are. First and foremost, we committed as a government when uh, the Obama-Biden administration reviewed how we handle these types of matters to doing a better job in a number of respects. And one of those was making sure that families and loved ones feel informed and supported during these really horrific ordeals. That has to be a guiding principle across cases. How that applies is case-specific. Different families want more information at different times. They want it 
presented in different ways, but the fundamental of ensuring that those who have the greatest stake in these matters are supported and informed, that's a key principle. I'll give you a second key principle, which is ensuring that those families are integrated as partners in recovery strategies. This was another outcome of that policy review almost a decade ago, in which we committed ourselves as a government to making sure that we were in discussions, in dialogue with loved ones, not just sharing information on the cases, but also talking through what our recovery strategy was, what our backup was, how long we were willing to try our current course of action before thinking it might be time to pivot to something else. And then I'll give you a third principle as well, which is keeping this a priority across the US government. That begins here at the White House with President Obama, begins with the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan. It applies to the Secretary of State, of course, uh, the Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs, the Hostage Recovery Fusion Cell at the FBI. But overall, it takes leadership to make something a persistent priority. We built the structures almost a decade ago to get there. We have the leaders right now with the President, with Jake, with the Secretary of State, uh, who are ensuring that that is translating into results, like the very happy result we're reaching here of welcoming Paul back to the United States, back with his family. Are there elements of this case that are relevant to others that are out there that may not be in the news right now? I think all of this, Steve, goes back to those conversations involving the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, and, and Rwandan government officials, in which we were able to make that pivot from simply saying, this must be resolved, this is unacceptable, to quietly saying, how? What steps can take us from here to there? And that involved, frankly, listening and listening to the Rwandan government as they explained what it was they were looking for from Paul, what they were looking for from Paul's family, what they were looking for from us. And look, that's hard. And that, that's the type of quiet diplomacy that, that frankly, Jake led from the highest levels of, of this government, sometimes over the phone, sometimes quite literally sitting in his office, that allowed us to work out a sequence in which we were able to say, OK, if this is what the Rwandan government is seeking from Paul, if Paul as an individual is, is willing to provide that, what comes next? What does that look like in the Rwandan system? OK, if he's released from prison, where does he go from there? And of course, we had a, a, another government, the government of Qatar, that helped facilitate taking Paul into their residence in Kigali and then flying him after a couple of days to Doha as a next step. What does it look like for the family? Um, of course, the, the family gets to choose what it wants to do with its own private civil litigation. But ultimately, the family, we as the US government, the Rwandan government, we were able to synchronize the pieces in a way that got us where we all wanted to go, which was resolving this matter, removing it as the significant bilateral irritant it was between two governments, and of course, reuniting someone with his family that missed him so. Has Qatar become our kind of detained person partner in the world? The Qatar is a, is a critical partner, and we are obviously very, very appreciative for the role they, they played in facilitating this. In a sense, their involvement in this matter and in our efforts to resolve it go back a ways. We did for this case what we do for, for matters like this, which is in addition to engaging, in this case, the Rwandans directly, we also do talk to, to shared partners, mutual partners, about how important this sort of resolution is to us as a government, as a White House, as a State Department, as a country. And uh, the Qataris have been part of those conversations. Thus, as we reached a point in which, through that quiet diplomacy I've been talking about, we were synchronizing the steps, the elements of the Rwandan process, even the logistics of what it meant to, to, to get this matter resolved, to get Paul from prison to somewhere else in Kigali, from Kigali to a third country, from a third country to the United States. Uh, the, the countries proved a really important partner, and they've been a partner on other things. You've seen us, Steve, thank them publicly for their role in getting home other Americans we have worked very hard as administration to bring home. And we are grateful for that sort of collaboration. I'm wondering, Josh, if you see a worrying trend in Americans that are detained or, or uh, taken and held um, against their will in countries around uh, the world. And I guess my personal observation is this seems to be like an industry growing and that worries me. Does it worry you? It does worry me. We, we do seem to be in a moment where there are governments uh, across the world who are uh, 
uh, willing to do uh, as you describe it, uh, to engage in practices that essentially treat uh, human beings uh, at times as as political tools, as, as bargaining chips. We've seen this obviously in, in Venezuela. We've seen this in, uh, in Russia, in Iran. We've worked very hard as an administration to bring home Americans from those three countries among others, despite the fact that we think there should be no detention like that in the first place. That when the Russians, for example, detain someone like Brittany Griner, that it is designated by the State Department, consistent with the Levinson Act and federal law, as a wrongful detention, precisely because that is the official stamp of the State Department saying this should never have happened in the first place. And we always want to be very clear about that, even as we do what we need to do, what we owe our citizens, what we owe their family members of resolving those particular cases. I think it's important to us as an administration not just to recognize the trend that, that you're describing, Steve, and the threat it poses, but also to try to deter and prevent what would be the next generation of cases from arising in the first place. And we've tried to do this in a few different ways. First of all, very early in his tenure as Secretary of State, Secretary Blinken put U.S. diplomatic weight behind a Canadian-led multilateral initiative against arbitrary detention, to try to strengthen the international norm against this sort of appalling practice. Uh, we've also uh, had the, the president issue last summer uh, an executive order that built on the Levinson Act and generated new capacity for things like financial sanctions and visa bars against those deemed to have engaged in hostage taking or wrongful detention of Americans. A third element, uh, also out of the State Department, was the introduction last summer of the D for wrongful detention indicator. So this is applied to a limited set of countries in the world where we want Americans to be very clear that they face a heightened risk of wrongful detention should they make the choice to travel there, which of course we urge them not to do. Already the State Department had warned about that risk in the, the language of their travel advisories, but making this even clearer with that D clearly affixed to certain countries we think can help to warn Americans and thus prevent some cases from arising in the first place. I mean, we do have a graphic here, you know, showing that Iran, China, Venezuela, Syria, Russia all engage in this practice. But that what is really remarkable is since 2011, when you had an average of Amer about four U.S. nationals being taken a year, that number is going up dramatically. And rather than being non-state actors, here we have four to, uh, to 11 uh, uh, a year right now. And I guess... The question is, it's, it's great to hear about international norms and to warn people, but as you see Americans in every nation of the world, are there other steps that can be taken to create disincentives um, for states doing this that, that, I, that may not be on my radar screen? Yeah, and then we should just pause a moment uh, to, to reflect on, on uh, Diane Foley, who has just contributed so much to this community of people who, who care about these issues and who turned, obviously, personal and family tragedy into really extraordinary uh, work, uh, work outside of government, but also work with government to keep the priority on resolving these cases and preventing uh, future ones. It really inspires a lot of us who, who work in, in this in this area. And, and to your point, and to a point that, that she and others have rightly called attention to, we do think we can and intend to do more to deter and by punishing deter future cases. So part of that executive order that I mentioned, part of the goal is over time as we build sanctions packages, often in conversation with those outside government, similar to how sanctions packages are built in the human rights context based on their input, their suggestions, um, as we uh, apply the sort of penalties that that executive order sets out, financial penalties, travel-related penalties, it will show that there are costs to engaging in this sort of behavior, wrongful detention and hostage taking. Of course, there are already some costs, and there are criminal prosecutions uh, led not, of course, uh, out of the White House, but by our colleagues at the Department of Justice uh, against individuals who take Americans against their will. And the Department of Justice in recent months uh, announced publicly some charges against individuals in Haiti who held a number of Americans uh, for months down there before we, working with our colleagues in, in federal law enforcement and others, were able to help resolve that matter and, and get those 16 Americans and their Canadian uh, traveling partner uh, safely released. 
So there are criminal penalties in certain mm -hmm. circumstances, and, and we're always grateful when, when those in federal law enforcement are able to utilize those tools available to them. But the executive order I mentioned, as well as the, the name and shame aspect of this, the fact that we are talking about how appalling it is as a practice to, to essentially treat human beings as, as bargaining chips, as political tools, as pawns, all of this we think can try to contribute to rolling back those trends you're describing, Steve. Now, one of the other uh, people just released was Jeffrey Woodkey, if I'm pronouncing his name correct, in Niger, uh, in, in, as part of a, a, a deal, it seems. And, and Anthony Blinken, Secretary of State, had visited uh, that country as well and had it. But two other big names we've heard are Paul Whelan in Russia, Austin Tice, perhaps, in Syria. Are there any dimensions of these cases that you could talk about on whether there's potential progress or other cases? And does visibility of these cases help or hurt? Yeah, all, all, all good questions, um, Steve, about cases that are very much on our minds and the minds of leadership at the White House and the State Department and elsewhere. So maybe going to Woodkey first, we were very, very gratified and relieved to see uh, Jeff emerge from over six years of being held as a hostage in, in West Africa. And we really are grateful, as we've said as a government publicly already, to the government of Niger. Uh, which was a tremendous partner in working to secure his release. He is uh, home in the United States with his family. I won't say more out of respect for his own privacy, other than what a relief it is to see him uh, out of captivity. Uh, many across the United States government worked tremendously hard over those six plus years to try to use every tool at our disposal intelligence related tools, military tools, law enforcement tools, diplomatic tools to reach. The point we've finally reached in in the past uh, week or so, which is seeing him released and seeing him home, and that's tremendously gratifying uh, to see. It is always the nature of this business that even in one week, as we celebrate and take a moment to to celebrate the the release of of a Jeff Woodkey, uh, a Paul Recessa Vagina, we also know that there are others, and we get back to work on those other cases and. Uh, I will, as you suspected, uh, leave to private discussions our ongoing efforts to secure the release of Paul Whelan, of Austin Tice, and of other Americans uh, held elsewhere in the world. But it, it is worth emphasizing that sometimes the very best work can be done quietly. Uh, it was years of work, um, in a sense, that resulted in Woodkey's release, in Recessivagina's release. And the type of um, constructive, careful, um, deliberate conversations that, for example, the National Security Advisor led in, in, in the context of securing Paul Recessa-Begina's release, that can often happen only effectively when it's away from the spotlight and when it's truly a private discussion. It's not, it's not posturing, it's instead a, a genuine back and forth about how we start from a situation that we as a government find unsustainable and get to an outcome that's mutually satisfactory. Josh, I would tell our audience that you were the founding executive director of something called the Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection. It's always been a reminder to me that not every nation's constitution, not every nation's legal um, infrastructure is the same. And that an arrest, uh, a conviction in a foreign country, say Egypt or Saudi Arabia or Singapore, um, may look unjust to some Americans, um, just as an arrest or conviction of a foreign national in U.S. courts can look unjust to those other countries. How much do we need to wave into this? this you're a real expert in this area. And I want to be open to the fact, as we talk to a global audience here, that there are some around the world who look at the United States as a place that has wrongfully detained people from their perspective. How, do, do we need to have, you know, some sort of alignment strategy when it comes to our laws around the world? So th this is part of what is built into the, the Levinson Act, the federal law that, that, that I mentioned uh, earlier when it comes to how the State Department, and it is assigned by law to our colleagues there, assess uh, Americans when they are detained abroad. And I, and I should emphasize that any American detained abroad is entitled to, and we do our best as a government to provide, a basic set of services. We hope to, to give them consular access, and we work very hard to deliver on that. We work hard to get them representation in court. Uh, we, rep we work hard to ensure that they are treated by the standards of the local legal system, whatever those might be. That's true for everyone, whether they are deemed a wrongful detainee or not. And there are decades of tradition behind that, but it's worth 
worth reminding uh, the viewers and listeners about that. Then what the Levinson Act formalized, I think quite constructively formalized, is another category, a very rare category, but a very important category, where the State Department assesses, based on 11 factors that are now set out in federal law, whether there is one more piece, which is that in addition to everything I described that every American detained abroad is entitled to, the detention is so unlawful or wrongful in our eyes, in the eyes of the State Department, that we, we take on one more responsibility, which is to use the full toolbox as best we can to try to bring that American home. And we all knew this category existed before. Uh, it, it had been written into some of the documents issued by President Obama at the culmination of that hostage policy review in 2015 that we were talking about earlier, Steve. But uh, I, I think what the Levinson Act, which was signed into law by President Trump in, in December 2000, uh, 2020, added was to set out the factors and to formalize the process. Hmm. And now you have within the State Department the relevant regional bureau. You have the Consular Affairs Bureau. You have the Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs, Roger Carstens, and his office. And you have the Office of the Legal Advisor all contributing into an analysis of whether the very specific, the very particular facts and circumstances of a new detention of an American abroad uh, qualify it as, as a wrongful detention case. That can take time. Mm -hmm. Gathering those facts and circumstances can take time. And sometimes we hear from families that they want to know where they are in that process, understandably. But at the same time, you want that process to be careful, to be deliberate, and to evaluate the sort of complexities you, Steve, are raising, which is these sorts of assessments, these sorts of evaluations need to be done against the backdrop of foreign legal systems to understand whether this treatment of a particular American in a particular set of circumstances reaches that very rare, but again, very important category of being deemed a wrongful detention case. Let me just ask you finally, now that you and your colleagues in the U.S. government <clears throat> and your interlocutors in the Rwandan government and also some in Qatar have unwound the knot that was surrounding Paul Rosessa Begina's imprisonment. Um, is there enthusiasm between Rwanda and the United States in pushing reset and doing new things? Look, I think every time we are able to work through with a foreign government resolution like this, that is a good thing. It's a good thing for the American who comes home. It's a good thing for their family. It's a good thing for both governments because we've just worked through something quite hard and we've removed, by definition, an irritant in our relationship. It doesn't mean that all the things to talk about have been resolved. We always have other things to talk about with foreign governments, some of them constructive, some of them hard conversations. But the fact that a representative of a foreign government can sit in our National Security Advisor's office and begin to lay out a pathway towards resolving something like this that at one point looked essentially unresolvable and get to a day when Paul returns to his family, that is a good thing in and of itself, and I think it does bode well for working through other hard issues. Well, it's a fascinating and important story, and we're very grateful to you, Joshua Gelcher, Deputy Homeland Security Advisor at the National Security Council, for sharing this background with us. Thanks so much. Thank you, Steve. So what's the bottom line? Each and every case of an American citizen or resident held by another government is really a different story. Many become geopolitical chess pieces, like basketball star Brittany Griner or international businessman Paul Whelan in Russia. She got out on a prisoner swamp, but he's still in jail. Paul Rosessa Begina had a different story. He was an outspoken critic of the president of Rwanda, and he was convicted in his country's courts on terrorism charges. In the end, the U.S. government and his lawyers used Rwanda's own clemency guidelines to secure a commutation of his sentence and get his release. So in this case, it's an opportunity to push reset on relations between Kigali and Washington and move forward. Those are precisely the kind of diplomatic chess moves the world needs to see more of. And that's the bottom line.